Hi, and welcome to another episode of the ARC podcast. I am Lindsay, and I am here with my uh, wonderful friend, Jen. How are you today, Jen? I am great. I'm super excited today. We've got a great guest today, Lindsay. You know, do you want to give the introduction? Yes, I do. So I had the pleasure of just like looking for a book for my son, um, usually where I always start looking for a book to read about what's going on. (laughs) And um, I found Eliza Fricker, who is an author and illustrator of the book Can't Not Won't, a story about a child who couldn't go to school. She also wrote The Family Experience of PDA, and her third book, Thumbsucker, is ready for pre-order. Whoop, whoop. That's exciting. And Eliza's a mom and she's neurodivergent herself and we're, she's an advocate. And so we're really excited to talk to her today and I have so many questions for her, but let's welcome her on. Eliza, thank you for joining us on the ARC podcast. Thanks for having me. That was a good intro. I like that one. <laughs> well, I've done so much reading on you because I just loved your book so much. I try to read as much as I can, um, Uh, on the neurodivergent perspective. So I read a lot of books written by people with autism. And then I saw this and then I read more about you and I'm like, I love basically everything you have to say, but I also love the illustrations Mm -hmm. in your book and your blog that you started. Um, It's the illustrations are what like, I feel like it's your superpower. I'm sure you feel the same way. Um, Tell us about how you got started writing about um, your daughter and her experience and your experience as well, and how you included these beautiful illustrations that make your point so clear. Yeah, I think it was um, really just being at home when we couldn't access school anymore. So my daughter had a breakdown um, and she was unable to go anywhere at that time. And I think a lot of this stuff had been, I was trying to process our experiences as we were going through them. And anyone who's been through a sort of protracted, stressful Mm -hmm. time will know that is a really difficult thing to do because you're you're on it and you're going through it every day. Um, So I don't think I was actually processing things very well at that time or didn't have the space to process those things. So when we were at home, that was the time that I could then do that. So it was really just a lot of time at home and I was just drawing and I was I think a lot of it was there's a lot of humor in those illustrations perhaps that's something you can't always do with just text it's the nuances Mm -hmm. and this and and the little bits um and it and it's very much used at you know it's always been in my family my dad was a political cartoonist so it's it's a bit of a coping mechanism the humor but it also feels quite at times almost I know this word gets banded around but it feels quite empowering to do it as well because some of the situations are utterly ridiculous that you're either offered or you're put (laughs) in with your child and so to be able to show that when the actual I mean I often do that I'll sort of show what's suggested and show the kind of reality of what we're going through um but yeah that was really why I did it to kind of process things and um it was meeting an editor at the time and she was like why don't you share this stuff and I was like why no one's going to look at it no one else is going through it um and obviously we now know (laughs) there are lots of people but yeah it was kind of processing and I guess a bit of loneliness as well being at home on my own Mm -hmm. and not being able to work anymore um and it immediately kind of created connections with other people who were similarly going through situations like ours so I think it's totally empowering like you said yes. because I obviously have a very very similar experience to you um with my son who is also on the spectrum and um really I mean we I don't know how many years we did this and I feel the same like I can't going through it was such a blur because you're just trying so hard um, and trying not to fail. Like you say so poignantly and trying to perfect this, like we've got to, you know, do what everyone else is doing. All kids go to school, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. what kids do. This is part of the program. And you're trying to like do your best. And my son just avoided school. And we always use the word avoided so much. Like 
he's just an avoider. Like he just is trying to get out of it. He's trying to manipulate us. And so your book like hit me because you're right. The humor is so perfect because it's like, literally I, I LOL throughout this whole book. Same, same. (laughs) I felt like, I felt like you were talking to me because we've been through it too with my son and it was like, oh my goodness, like it's nice not to be alone and then laugh at the situation because I can think of a similar situation that we were in and how like awful I felt, but nice to know that I wasn't alone and that other people are going through it. And you have to laugh at some point, like, or else you're never going to survive. Like, yeah. yeah. And I think that that is, is really important with our own mental health is that that kind of isolation we feel mm-hmm. um, is really impactful. You know, I often talk, I, I did an interview recently and I was saying, if someone had said any of those professionals and most were well-meaning, you know, you've got to remember they're trapped by these systems too. But if one of them had said, you are not alone in this, there's loads of families that go through this. Have you seen this or have you looked at this? Mm-hmm. And immediately put those connections out there for me that would have made a huge difference because when you're isolated when you've got people sort of insinuating you're an enigma of a family where does that place you you know and obviously now I know that as well as that I am myself neurodivergent but when you've always had that sort of sense of otherness plus there's people suggesting you know you're you're really different we've never had this that's not good that is not a good place to be in for your own well-being no, and you're um, talking about the family support groups got me too, because it's like, we want to talk to other families about these things, but like, we don't necessarily want to put be put in this situation where we're like talking about really personal things to any, to everybody in a group where like someone's leading it that really doesn't get it usually. And it was, it cracked me up because <laughs> it was like, why did I spend so much time I thought to myself the same thing like why did I spend so much time going outside of my house to these professionals and family support and all these things when like I should have been here with my son and me who are like our relationship I say sometimes like we're almost like symbiotic like the two of us Mm -hmm. like are so so connected that why would I break that connection to like go outside and find what I needed when it was like right here all along I think talk about like trust and connection and how important that is and maybe first talk about PDA and what is PDA because some of our listeners might not know a ton about it we, we talk a lot about autism but maybe give us a little bit about PDA and then talk about trust and why it's so important yeah so PDA is um is a term, well, it means pathological demand avoidance. Um, there's some quite nice other other acronyms for it now. So, you know, pervasive drive for autonomy. Um, but it basically is a kind of, is part of the autism spectrum, but it means that the anxiety is so high that there is a kind of, there's a, there's a need for autonomy there. But it it also means that there is a need for that child to have a lot of flexibility you need to kind of have a lot of creativity all i'm thinking right now is the the easiest way to say it is actually you just need to rip up all the parenting books (laughs) rip up all the societal rules and then start and meet your child where they're at i mean it's very different i guess from what we are I mean, Dr. Naomi Fisher and I, who do a lot of webinars together, we, we we call it the good parenting TM, the good parenting trademark of what a good parent is. You're very much doing things very differently. So you can imagine in that kind of educational setting, it's incredibly difficult to meet these children's needs because you're asking educational settings to be flexible, to be non-hierarchical, to give these children autonomy, um, to really spend a lot of time going with one thing one day and it's probably not going to work the next day and you won't have any no you won't have any answers as to why that won't work the next day um it it is very difficult it's very difficult for educational settings but as a parent it's it is it's a very kind of holistic um child-led 
way of of, of working with your child. Um, so when we talk about things like low demand parenting working really well, um, that's something that people will probably assume is kind of not doing very much as a parent, but it's doing an awful lot. Um, but it's very different from what traditional parenting would see as kind of routines and structure and building resilience and getting them to learn to get on with things. It's very, very different from that. It's very holistic and gentle. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I mean, it's like the opposite of what we learned in our own families a yeah. lot of us um hope i think a lot of people did have this experience and just maybe it wasn't talked about as much as they were kids i think we just saw um societally culturally on tv or whatever it is or reading it was this is it was all about you have to kind of treat all kids like little soldiers that they have to like mm -hmm. all into these programs and it's so opposite for our kids too, because with autism, it's like structure and they really like sameness. And, and I think there's like this assumed thing where um, everyone else kind of thinks our kids need like so much constant guidance mm -hmm. and like control from us. And honestly, when I was like a younger parent, control is like my jam, you know, like mm -hmm. I like to control my life and like keep things in control. This is like, the number one thing I probably talk about in therapy is control. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I can do this. Like I can like design a whole life for a person who just needs me to like guide them and give them the push that they need to do all the things. And then you're like, why am I hitting these walls all the time with this child? Like why? And then when it finally, for me, it like turned when I just really changed my perspective pretty early on um, to more of like an empathetic, compassionate role of like, oh my gosh, he experiences everything so different. So I really need to like see him and listen to him and kind of let him lead me. And when I observe him and sit back a little bit, that's why I think a lot of what you're talking about is like sitting back a little bit. And people mm -hmm. are like, you can't sit back when you're parenting, you have to be like all over it. And when I sat back, I was like, oh, look at that. He didn't just fall apart. He actually can like direct himself very well and look at all the cool things I can learn about how to support him. And it is really about listening and building like trust and connection like you're saying that's, that's it and I think you talking about kind of connection next is what's where most families get to with this is that they are in a really bad place with their child mm -hmm. and it is not working so it it's not as if you know we're all these kind of feckless families that have not tried this stuff with our children most of us have tried traditional parenting and it doesn't work and it's actually quite disastrous and most families I speak to just say we can't carry on like this and what ultimately you've done is you've lost that connection with your child mm -hmm. and that is something that i think we get to a point and we think we can't go on like this you know we have to find a way where i i'm understanding my child and then eventually we build back in that connection and i think that unfortunately that's something that's very much lost when we're forcing our children into the school environment when it's not working for them um, you can see that child beginning to shut down and, and that's a dreadful place to get to as a parent mm -hmm. and a child. It is. Talk about like the bad mom experience that you had. You talked a lot about it in here in this book about how you felt like a bad mom. You're kind of questioning yourself a lot. And I think as caregivers, we do this like constantly because we care so much, but we also like still have all these cultural societal like expectations of ourselves. And we're just want to make sure we're doing the right thing. And there's kind of so much pressure. Like Lindsay and I always talk about, like, I have to figure this out, like for him to be like the adult that he yeah. needs to be. And I don't want to mess this up to where I have just, it's all, it's all my fault. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pressure on moms, especially, I think. Can you talk a little bit about that? And Yeah, actually, it came up last week. So there's me 
doing all the work that I do and I'm so healed. And then unfortunately we were put in a position of having a meeting again that, that completely spun me out. You know, I haven't had a meeting mm -hmm. like that for years, but where, you know, there was some quite, well, I was called mum in the meeting several times, which I'm, I'm not keen on to say the least because it, it differentiates your position of where you are with that professional immediately. It puts you on a lower setting. Um, but also, you know, words were used in that meeting. If you think that that is morally okay, was actually said in this meeting. Um, now I am, I mean, I'm not going to say it didn't impact me that when that happened, but I am able now to sort of say in those meetings, I'm, I don't want to talk to you any more. Um, you know, this isn't a safe space, you know, but th back then, um, it was incredibly difficult because I didn't have that confidence myself of what we were doing. I hadn't had any green shoots then because when you are going through that sort of system and your child is basically crumbling before your eyes and you're still trying to do kind of traditional parenting, get them into school, do all those things. Um, I didn't have that confidence. I was doing it right as a parent, you know, my, mm -hmm. my gut and my instinct was like, none of this is right, but it was all being quietened down by, you know, but you need to get them to school and you need to get them to do this. So I probably didn't have that confidence that, for example, when I had that meeting the other week, it was still impactful, but I do have the confidence now to politely, you know, stop those conversations, which I know are unhelpful or harmful. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you're under that sort of scrutiny and judgment, the biggest one is you're a parent, usually, like you said, a mother who can't get their child into school. Now, most families do manage to do that. So what kind of parent are you if you can't even get your child to school? You know, So that is playing heavily into everything. Um, and I talk about it in one of the presentations that I do that you know you're kind of up for anything in these situations as well you are people seem to think it's okay to ask you lots of things that probably are not okay and i say in one of the presentations that i was once asked by a middle-aged white man that i'd never met before if i'd had a traumatic birth now that was asked in a meeting i'd never met him before you know is that okay i don't think that is you know what am i meant to do even if i had you know am i going to share it there and then so you know, you're putting a lot of situations that really push the boundaries of what is okay. They're not trauma informed, let's face it, most of these meetings. So, um, yeah, it's incredibly difficult to be under that sort of judgment and, and not have that confidence in yourself. And I think that was one of the, you know, brilliant things. Obviously, you don't want to see your child have a breakdown, but when you can pull away from things and have that space to then build on what you know you need to do for your family, that's when the confidence grows as you see those green shoots come in and you see your child start to slowly heal and eventually thrive um you know that's when the confidence that you you know what your child needs ultimately yeah mm -hmm. I know I think a lot of us just keep going and try and try and try and there's not a lot of um stop sit back like let's see what's going on and like let's try to heal what's happening and like take some time i think with a lot of our kids it's like you don't have time like you need to get on this at 15 months they need to be figuring all of these things out because you have like a small window of time and i i had the experience during covid where i actually was i felt very like uh there was a silver lining i guess where i was like I have this time that I was actually very present during it, which was really hard sometimes, but also like helpful to me because I actually did see like how he reacted to like some of his schoolwork and how he reacted when he, even when we were in a zoom class and what he could do um, given the fact that he could like stay home and like be in his PJs and mm -hmm. eat what he wanted to and, have access to all the things he needed. And I was like, whoa, like, I wish more families, if I felt really privileged to do it. And I wish more families had that time to take, uh, because it's so important to take that time 
I don't know what yeah, my question I think is. things you don't <laughs> notice, like even I didn't even notice sort of the, how long like pr her processing time was, mm -hmm. you know, because you're under it, you're on, you know, they're under enormous, I mean, I call it that when they're in that sort of stressful state all the time, they are just surviving, not thriving. So you're not, you know, and you are too, and you're not getting to see all these little things. It's only when you pull back that you can really see how they work, what makes them tick, but that is all slowing things down and pulling back. And, and I think, you know, there is this ramped up pressure, isn't there? I've just, it all feels really kind of poignant because I've just been drawing, um, we're doing, uh, Naomi and I are doing a big piece of work here for a charity on parent mm -hmm. well-being. So all these, I've just been drawing it this morning, but all these sort of cartoons are sort of coming into my head. There's one where there's a, I was drawing it this morning of a parent being pelted with tomatoes by other parents about all the ways they're not good parent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's how we feel. We feel under enormous um, scrutiny from others, but we're actually missing being able to focus on what we need to focus on, which is our child and what they need. We can't even see that, can we really at that moment? Mm -hmm. No. And I think you're right. Like it's about confidence, like, and understanding like that you are actually like a part of the team mm -hmm. and you're actually probably, you are the most important part of the team. And I, I can't tell you how many like IEP meetings I've been in for, with others as the advocate. Um, and I watch the parent just slowly just just curl up in themselves and let all these other people guide the meeting, take make all the decisions. And like the parent's there and she wants to advocate and he, the dad too, like you can tell that they like know their kid. They want to say some things. They want to be heard, but they feel like there is someone else that like knows more. This is a situation where I, I'm not a teacher. Like I didn't become a principal. I don't, I'm not a special education director. You know, I'm doing this without these credentials, I guess. And how do you gain that confidence? I guess you talked a little bit about when you see it actually working, it helps gain confidence, but what would you tell to other parents? Like maybe in that meeting or when they're in a situation where they're like, I thought someone else was responsible for this and they're, this isn't working. And then really when it hits the fan and your kid's like not going to school or having behavior issues or whatever it is, then everybody kind of backs out and then it's on you to deal with it anyway. So what would you tell a parent in that situation? Well, I think we're still working on a kind of medical model, aren't we? So a medical mm -hmm. model, is looking at locating the problem in the individual so the onus is on that individual the child to change to fit that environment so there is only so much that is going to happen when you are kind of working along that narrative if you start to think of it differently and you start to look at the impact of the environment if you look at kind of if you can start to look at all the adjustments and adaptations need to come from the, the environment and, and the, the adult supporting that young person, that will make a huge difference. So you can start to look at it quite differently and through a different lens, because when you're having those meetings, what you're often looking at is kind of the, you're very much being kind of looked at through the lens of, um, let's fix the child to fit this environment. Now, if you flip it and you start to go, okay, is this environment right for my child? There isn't any way when we look at a standardized system of learning that that is going to work for everyone. It can't, you know, because we're not all the same. And that's really helpful to know, not in a kind of bleak, um, you know, this setting isn't going to work, but it's helpful to know that, you know, you're not constantly fighting up against it. You know, you have the choice. There's a lot of choices as a parent that you can make. And I think often we think it's school or nothing. And we kind mm -hmm. of have this idea in our heads that we're then falling off a cliff edge, which we often are falling off a cliff edge because we've hung so much hope on this this place to fix it and sort it out actually we can do an enormous lot you know a huge amount as parents for our children um most of it will come from us you know we can do this we can give them all the emotional support we can look at different ways that they can learn different environments that can work for them and we can be that person for them and i think even small things like parents think that they can't say to their child um, when that child expresses their distress about school, parents actually think, 
oh, I, I can't agree with them on that because that will only compound the issue, then they definitely won't go to school. But actually, if you think about it, if a child is able to share that distress with you, and it's quite safe to do that, and you can say, God, yeah, that must have been really hard. How much difference will that make than you saying, come on, uh, you know, it's fine. I'm sure they didn't mean it. You know, change those conversations. There's an awful lot we can do as parents. Totally. I I had the same situation. Like Jack and I are so connected, um, but I loved school. Like school, I went to law school. Like I want, I would keep going forever if I could. So like for me, I was like, I can't get this, you know, but my husband hated school, like hated it. And I will say that he's um, similar to Jack in many ways and um, very introverted, needs a lot of time to recharge after social situations. And so I used to, Jack used to say, I hate school. And Chris would say to me later, like, I hated school too. I hated it. And I'm like, you can't tell him that Chris, like then he's, he looks up to you so much. You can't tell him that. And then it seriously like occurred to me one day, cause exa- I forget what the situation was, but they totally connected on hating school and why, but then it turned into like what they liked about it and they could like kind of touch on the other things and I'm like oh why didn't I just trust that they sh- connection is the whole thing like and making and like finding those other people like I felt so much pressure it had to be me to like figure this out but like I think that's why we all want our kids to go to school because we want other people to help us figure this out and we're mm-hmm. going to give some of that responsibility that we have to like others And this is a cool structure like that everybody else gets to do. And like, why not get some help? Um, But maybe that help isn't from that, but it's from like other people in your life that you can help like foster that connection. How do you feel your daughter is doing now? Um, I'm hoping, it seemed like at the book, at the end of the book that you guys found a really good place for her and, are you doing like some homeschooling and some school or like, how do you, how do you make it work now? Uh, yeah. I mean, completely, she's completely thriving. She's nearly 16. She's out and about. She's got a big group of friends. They all meet, we live by the beach. So she's out and about, they meet down the beach. She gets the bus around town. Mm-hmm. She's absolutely thriving. And I think that that's something that when we are going through it, I think our biggest fear, and I think we have to go to those biggest fears, but our biggest fears are we will have a child who is not able to be in, I think probably not independent, living at home forever, not having a job. If they're, have, if they're very dysregulated, we probably worry about prison, um, you know, but we have to go to those places because actually a lot of our thing is, you know, we are fearful of the future and where they, where they potentially will end up or not end up. Um, And actually with the way that we have restructured our life and our perspective and what we want for our child, she's actually, because of that, she is thriving. So she's completely independent. She's not dysregulated. She's I mean, she went to New York um, with her dad for 10 days without me a few weeks ago. The plane was cancelled on the way home, was absolutely fine. Just rebooked another plane. You know, things that you just think, is this ever, is this really, you know, that's that can happen, you know. Um, Mm. Education, she checks in and out of a place. She's not really that interested. She wants to earn money. I have no worries about that anymore you know those sort of things I mean we're heading for kind of we have the exams at 60 well when they about the age of 16 so we're heading to that we're in that kind of last few months when those are going to happen so obviously that's what everyone is asking um but I don't worry about that it's not an interest to me you know whether she gets those or not is is of no concern because she's so well, I know she'll be fine. She'll find her own way. I don't know what she'll do. I didn't know what I wanted to do at that age, but she'll find her way. Yeah. I think it's Mm. like time too. Like, I just know that Jack's just going to need like lots of time to like figure this all out. And 
those first like few years of his life, I just felt like he should have like been in my belly still. Like <laughs> and yeah. it was too early for him to be out here in this craziness. And he just needs a lot of extra time to do it. And I think the low demand parenting speaks to me so much because I think he'll we're all gonna have to figure out what we're, you know, how this is gonna work in your life and what you want to do and how to make money and all the things. But I guess it just seems like the demands, right, like from us, from the very people that they like trust, puts them in such a spot where like they're just going to fail that. Like there's just no like, and failing's okay in, in some respects. So I guess I just mean like, it just seems to be like the, once again, like the opposite of how we're supposed to allow kids to like expand and thrive and bloom into like who they are by always being like, this is how it is. And you need to fit this. And this is. And it's funny, isn't it? Because life really isn't like that. You know, a lot oh, of these. Not at all. Like, like career ladder. There's no career ladder. Like we don't go on this ladder and just work our way up. I mean, there's some mm-hmm. people do. But most people do this anyway. And curveballs in life can come at all times, at any times, because this is something I hear from a lot of families. And they're like, you know, my child's had a breakdown, but I can't give up work. So they have to go to school. And I'm like, well, you know, they're really, really poorly. And, you know, if they had broken both their legs and been run over for a bus, you wouldn't be saying this. So we, it's again, we have to kind of reframe all this stuff all the time. Um, our children will become really, really resilient. Um, Cause I know people love that word, um, but they will become really resilient, but they will learn it very differently. They will learn it through this safety that we create for them where they yes. know that they there's always a get out. You know, mm-hmm. for our children who are really pressure sensitive, they know that they can always get out of that situation. That's really, really important for them. You know, mm-hmm. we give it a go. We try it. If it doesn't work, oh, well, we'll try something else. I think it takes me back to that privilege I talked about before where like I because I have the same reaction to parents that I'm talking to. I'm like, you, I just know that they need to be home with their child. But I I know that they also need to work and be out Um, One of the things that Lindsay and I work really hard on um, in our advocacy is caregiver policy, things like paid family leave, Mm -hmm. um, making sure that parents who do have to leave the workforce um, have safety nets, just like everyone else, that they know that like that time that they left, you know, there was much needed. It's a job. I mean, this is like the hardest job Mm -hmm. I've ever had, hands down. Um, as being a parent and a caregiver and someone who is, like you said, always being creative and thoughtful. Um, There's no harder job. So we are working really hard at trying to develop some policies in Ohio and trying to get some of our lawmakers on board with paid family leave and um, basically like making sure the care economy and the people that care for others are taken care of how do you feel like that's working where you are you're in the uk correct i mean just think about a sort of charles dickens england at the moment where we are in the uk i mean it's we're under a government that is pretty brutal so um mm-hmm. yeah they're not too understanding of uh benefit system as a whole the government we're under um we also have within our so it's broken up into local authorities and Um, the local authority I'm under, they don't recognize respite care for Mm. um, or personal budgets for families unless that child or young person has a physical or intellectual disability. So there are so many families who are on their own with a very, very unwell PDA child. And I say that because, you know, it does change with a PDA child, but when they're very unwell, that is very high demand. And they are on their own with that child and they have no financial support and it is not recognized because our models are really outdated. Um, Our models of what that looks like is very different. You know, these were set up a long time ago, these systems of support. And I think this is what I hear a lot from families with sort of PDA kids. When they're unwell, it's a very high, very, a, a, a lot of need. Um, but most of the kind of charities we've got here, 
they don't really get it. <laughs> They're not really set up for it. Um, they don't really understand it. So, you know, even our kind of local, we've got um, a sort of big local charity where I live and all the pictures are on the window of this charity are all pictures of children with physical disabilities. So it's very difficult for people to understand, you know, these kind of more complex um things going on like pda they just don't really get it i'm afraid they're not there yet with it yeah we have a lot of work to do you're exactly right that our policies were put in place however over here too across the pond mm -hmm. um, when um it was just assumed that there would be a mom home taking care of the kids women were supposed to stay home right and like mm -hmm. do all of this so all of our policies reflect that still and even when women were joining the workforce um, and tried to get some of these policies changed, I mean, that it just did not get changed the way our actual economy works. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, I appreciate you. I think you're writing a book um, like this. And I want you to mention, too, your, your next book. I think it... Um, you're teaching everyone how um, families like ours are doing this alone and super isolated and what it actually looks like. And as you know, from how successful this is, you are not alone and I'm mm -hmm. not alone. And there's so many people um, who need these policies. So we're going to keep working on it um, here in Ohio and at the federal level, I, our administration actually right now, our Biden administration is care is like one of their four main pillars of their priorities. So we have a good federal administration. Of course we do have a divided, um, our house is, a is, is, um, not under, you know, it's Republican. So they they don't exactly want to do a whole lot on care, but we're working on it. We're working on our own Senator, <laughs> yeah. Congressman. <laughs> But real quick, Eliza, before you go, tell us about your newest book so that people can pre-order it, Thumbsucker. Mm -hmm. So Thumbsucker is um, exploring, so it's looking at my childhood as an undiagnosed autistic child. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, it's all kind of illustrated comic strips. And I've named each chapter after names that I was called. So mm -hmm. um, things like Chatterbox, Wimp, hypochondriac, weirdo. And then I've broken those down into those experiences and potentially why I was called those names. And I put it to my publisher and I said, I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure one or both parents are neurodivergent when, you know, if their child mm -hmm. is, it's often, you know, I do consults with women and they're always saying, oh, it's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely my husband. And actually, you know, I speak to so many women and they are also neurodivergent. And I said, I'd really like to write something where, you know, it gets people to think about that for themselves. Because often when we're trying to sort of support our children, we're quite traumatized. So there's a lot of conversations like, well, I had to get on with it. That's something I hear quite a lot. Well, I had to do it. And then I'm like, okay, and how was that, if you're honest for you? So, you know, it, it's a really gentle way of kind of exploring potentially your own diagnosis. It doesn't feel very safe to do that when you're in the school system. I get it when you're going to those meetings. But this is kind of a nice, gentle way of kind of potentially exploring that. And I put that to my publisher and then we put some of it out there. And then lots of families are saying, oh, now I actually understand my child better as well. So it's kind of working on two strands. It's sort of obviously for adults, but also to understand their, their own children a bit better. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a kind of, there's obviously the humor in there as well. And then they've got a big, um, there's a big bit at the end, a big afterword by um, Dr. Naomi Fisher, who I work with, who's a, mm -hmm psychologists sort of talking again about you know it's not even about diagnosis ultimately we can just meet our children where they're at and imagine the difference if we did that um if we could just not worry about where we think they should be at and just meet them where they are at um and actually i've written quite a few posts because my parents were probably <laughs> quite low demand actually so i was quite fortunate in a sense you know there obviously were situations that perplex them 
Um, but equally, they were really good about things like food. So I had like a really restricted diet, which would be ramped up with anxiety. Um, they were quite happy to just go with that and and make me those few food groups that I would eat. Um, and there wasn't that pressure there. But then I show sort of when I have to leave the house and go to like a friend's house and eat something that's prepared there. And we all have to sit at the table and finish it all and that anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there's kind of lots about how I was brought up and the things that helped me, but also the bits that kind of confused everyone, really, that, you know, they didn't really understand why I was having meltdowns and, yeah. That's so good. Do you feel like mm -hmm. there's like a movement of moms, neurodivergent, neurodivergent moms? Um, I feel like I just, I'm like a, a fangirl <laughs> because you get it on so many levels as the parent trying to do your best yourself trying to um, figure out what your needs are and like your coping mechanisms and like how you can um, kind of develop your own life. I'm just now learning this, like in my forties, I don't know where I lie. I mean, I'm somewhere on that spectrum a little bit maybe, but I, um, I learned all these like coping things. And then in my forties, I'm like, actually, I just like want to like develop how my life is <laughs> like mm -hmm. and how, how I like make my life, like how I want it. Not so much to like, just like keep doing hard things and like coping with them. Uh, I just think there's a lot of moms like you who are like kind of giving us that permission to do that. And I thank you for that because I, I think the work that you're doing is so important and it's powerful. I think it only works when we do that. I think I think what we're doing is we we are surviving in this kind of the way that we've done it, but we're also butting up against it. And what has been really nice is to be able now. I can't, I, th I think while you don't need, you know, I'm. I think in the future we probably won't be diagnosing children as much i think mm -hmm. if we can meet them where they're at and kind of we probably won't need to but i think for adults who feel this otherness all their life perhaps as women i know we become perfectionists um we take yeah. on these roles i certainly was like if i if i get married and i do this and i do this then no one will kind of find me out and i will do that perfectly um getting that diagnosis has allowed me to go no, I, I know I've always been different and I'm actually just going to be different now and I'm going to have genuine, true connections. I'm not going to burn myself out doing things I don't want to do, being a people pleaser, fawning, all those things that actually were impactful on me. And I'm actually going to say, sorry, that doesn't work for me or no, thank you. Or that makes me uncomfortable and put those boundaries in. These are all things that unfortunately have been negatively impactful on us as women who are late diagnosed because we were told to just get on with it and carry on with things that weren't okay for us and that's why you know I feel really that's probably where that kind of before I knew about myself while I was doing it for my child I don't want them to go through uncomfortable situations mm -hmm. that then they learn the only way to get through them is to suck it up and actually be really uncomfortable and go into things not knowing if that's right or wrong for them I want her to do things because she feels good about it. Mm -hmm. um, and and for people, the naysayers, because I can always hear them say, well, we've all got to do things we don't like. I have actually right now got a pretty nice life that I have created for myself that is working for me and for my daughter. You can have a nice life. There's all this stuff around being an adult, isn't there? That's like, well, we've all got to do these things. We don't want to do them. And it's, uh, we make it sound really miserable. It doesn't have to be at all. Exa that's exactly. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, it's just, I'm having like an aha as I'm talking because I have, I've been thinking about this so much. Like, even in my job, like I love my job, but if there's something like I don't want to do, I just kind of like change it to like do it the way that like I'll want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to just uh, grin and bear it and like do it the way that everyone has always done it before. I just like make it work for me. And I'm like, wow, isn't it neat how you can like love your job and like even parenting, like just do it how you want to do it. Like my husband and I had so many like like back and forth about like parenting a lot, especially earlier on. 
and I, he's he was right all along I hope he doesn't listen to this but like <laughs> we don't need to change ourselves like so much to do this like be yourself and develop like your the way you actually want to live and then let everyone else in your family live the way they want to live and it's remarkable how it like cuts down all of the problems and trauma and everything else that we kind of create for ourselves and honestly like you're at this is super advocacy right now it's like we talk a lot about how to be a good advocate this is how you advocate by modeling a good life Mm -hmm. yep yeah and i just think that there's so much gloominess particularly around pda stuff i don't know if you feel like that i always find Mm -hmm. it so gloomy and i'm like it's not gloomy like i've got a pda profile a lot of my family have like we're all like very energized connected humorous people this idea of pda where you have this inability to do anything is just not true it's just that the environment's got to be right for us to thrive And that's why people should read your book because it is yes, so, definitely. I seriously laughed the whole time. So mm-hmm. Eliza Fricker can't not won't a story about a child who couldn't go to school, not wouldn't, couldn't. Um, Eliza also has a book thumb sucker that's um, on pre-order. It'll be out in December. Mm-hmm. So check her out. We really, really, really appreciate you coming on and making the time for us. Eliza Fricker. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you next time.